I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! You got space, man, huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Hi everyone, you're watching the Wrestle Rock Podcast uh, Special Edition. We are with uh, my partner Benoit, aka Nostradamus Ben, but we have the Native American Tatanka. How are you today? Tatanka's my right here on the Wrestle Rock podcast. How are you guys doing out hey, there? Thank you so Pleasure much. to be here. Awesome. Yes. That, that's awesome that you can take uh, it's a an lot honor of time. Uh, oh, thank uh, you. Thank this you. This is very appreciated. We know that you are very busy, as yes. we yeah. discuss. Uh, you were in uh, in Ottawa last week. Yes, and that's super cool. So. And now here we are in Jersey. Yeah. We get all, and you guys get around too. You're doing some traveling also. Yeah, we we uh, we travel during eight hours. That was uh, uh, our travel, but. Good. We are here, so awesome. for the ISPW 25, this is yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They got a good great rain, crowd. It was very, very rainy on the road. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it rained on here, too. Highway, yes. Yeah, cool. And we would like to discuss about uh, your career in 1987s. Um, um, could you provide some insights into your bodybuilding career and your uh, NFL tryout with the Miami Dolphins? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I've always been a competitive athlete i mean yeah from high school which i went to school in virginia beach virginia beach area hampton virginia actually we're state champions in football so okay. always been an athlete so from playing in sports always weight training you know then going to college on a football scholarship still weight training getting bigger and bigger <laughs> through all that time yeah. finally when i came back after college started doing some more real serious weight training mm -hmm. and before you knew it i was competing in bodybuilding shows and in, in the virginia area i was competing in uh all over the all over the nation actually i was doing a lot of different shows uh i was doing so well that i was actually in florida and i had won uh, a couple really really big bodybuilding shows but i was at one called the southern states where i had done so well there that I really had to make a decision if I wanted to be a professional bodybuilder mm -hmm. or if I wanted to, you know, play another sport. There was yeah. still, it's still inside of me, you know, I just came out of football. There was still something inside of me wanting to play a sport, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and not really bodybuilding, but I enjoyed bodybuilding because it worked with everything that I did. So during that time, really good shape, winning a lot of different shows. Uh, I met a football agent, okay. NFL agent that okay. uh, said, listen, you have a great background. You have uh, a lot of NFL teams that were already interested in you right out of high school. Uh, I'd like to pick you up as a free agent. So I went for a football trials for the Miami Dolphins. Mm -hmm. This is a time when they had Dan Marino there, oh, yeah. Duper, mm -hmm. Clayton. He had an unbelievable, boom, I mean, had an unbelievable offensive armory there. Mm -hmm. So that was a really, really good time for – to be able to play for the Dolphins. They had a yeah. great team during that time. So the they, body for that. Yes, oh, yeah. correct. I, they had about, uh, that day, they probably had about, uh, I don't know, I'd say at least three, 4,000, if probably three, four 4,000 people who tried out. There was wow. a football field was full, wow. plus there were people on the side, but they were cutting people like this. Boom. It was one day tryout. Okay, if you didn't have fast enough 40, cut if you didn't do drills i mean they were cutting people to get down to the new grade yeah. so at the very very end of the day when it was all said and done there was basically about a hundred i'd say about a hundred guys that were left maybe a little bit less than a hundred and they were interested in all of us and i was one of those they offered us a free agent contract which during that time was only seventy thousand dollars a year Okay. Which is not bad money, not bad. but then you could renegotiate that next year and you could have millions of dollars. But I was working for Bally's at that time. <laughs> I was already making a six-digit income. I was already making great money, and they were already grooming me for a quarter of a million dollar position for the company. So I turned down the NFL offer because I was already in a great position where I was at, plus playing football, 
You could really get hurt, and you could be out just like that. I couldn't go back to my corporate position. Okay. So I didn't want to take any chances losing that corporate position. But during that time and during that football is how wrestling began. Okay, Mr. Chavis, did your life change significantly in 1989 when you encountered the legendary Buddy Rogers in the video club? Yeah, that's it. Uh, actually, who I met was a young kid. He was a young kid, and, and the young kid had some other young friends. And every time I went to Blockbuster Video, I kept running into these kids. <laughs> and it was like destiny. I kept running into the kids, kept running into them. And he kept telling me, you should be a pro bodybuilder. You should be a pro body. No, I mean, excuse me. You should be a pro wrestler. You should be a pro wrestler. You should be a pro wrestler. Finally, I told the kids, okay, listen, if you're really, you know a lot about this. If you're really saying I should be a pro wrestler, I said, Uh, I said, tell me why and tell me how you can help me get to, there's only one company, War Wrestling Federation and WCW. Oh, yeah. So how can you help out? He says, well, I know someone important in the business. And he said, as far as training, we know where to send you to school. I said, okay, well, who is that person that you know in the business? That's when he told me, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. So what he did is he set up an appointment for me to actually go to Buddy Rogers' house He lived in down in Fort Lauderdale, down in a, a really nice area, money area. His house was on the water in a coastal waterway. Went there. Him and his wife were there. He was all dressed up nice, suit, very classy. Buddy Rogers was very classy. And his wife. He had all these championship belts in the wow. shadow box glasses Ooh. up on his end. You could look out the back and you could see the, the intercoastal world. It's just a beautiful home. Uh, Buddy Rogers and myself hit it off big time that night. He loved me. I loved him. But I wasn't ready just to make a decision to leave a $100,000 a year job grooming me for a quarter of a me in a year. I wasn't just so quick to just say, okay, yeah, let's do it. So what happened after meeting Buddy at his house I hadn't made any decision yet. I'm sitting in my office at Bally's Corporation where we work 12-hour days, 14-hour days, doing a lot, a lot of business there. And all of a sudden, I'm in my office doing paperwork. Who walks up the stairs unannounced? Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. Walks up the stairs, comes in my office, sets down. He talks to me again, and after he talked to me that time, that was it. I was hooked. And that's when I made the decision to go to wrestling. And we would like to discuss about your uh, wonderful experience with Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 9. Uh, can you share uh, this, uh, this experience with, with us? Because I imagine that is probably one of your uh, best experience of your life. Oh, definitely. Uh, what most fans don't realize is you got a lot of, you got a lot of great wrestlers out there, but the re not every wrestler has been at a WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of people at WWE currently, they haven't been in a WrestleMania. So just to be in a WrestleMania match, that's the big thing. Mm -hmm. In our industry, that's the pinnacle of success. There's nothing higher. Yeah, people could say, well, the Hall of Fame, yeah, the Hall of Fame's great, okay? But being in a WrestleMania is awesome. As far as a wrestling event, it's the yeah, it's, yeah, that's the cream of the crop. That's it. It's yeah. huge, oh, you know? Huge. <laughs> so to be at WrestleMania 9... At Caesar's Palace, yeah, Las places. Vegas. I mean, you know, you're talking, oh, yeah. you know, you're you're in Showtown. You're in the entertainment yeah. world. You know, you're you're putting on an event not only live to that local area, but again on pay per view going all over the world. And it's Shawn Michaels and myself for the Intercontinental oh, Title. So a tremendous opportunity not only to shine, but even greater than that. Vince knew that we because of our matches before, we had such great matches. He knew that, which was never done before, never was a WrestleMania pay-per-view, or I don't think any pay-per-view, I'm not sure, but I do know for WrestleMania pay-per-view, never did they ever start it with a title match. We were the first match to actually begin at WrestleMania for a title match, Shawn Michaels and myself. And also... That's a big match to kick off the night, you know? Yeah, the, the best yeah. And, and that's what everybody's always told me. It's not because it's just me. Everyone's always said, you and Sean are the ones that, I won't say saved WrestleMania 9, but they said, you guys were the best match because there were some other matches that were not up to their expectation, but your match was the match that really made WrestleMania 9. And again, you have to give your hats off to Shawn Michaels, too. What a great worker. 
what a great talent, you know, Hall of Famer, you know, what a great talent in the business. So if you or someone like Sean or someone like me who loves to go out there and put on a great event for the fans, two guys like that can have a phenomenal match. So we had a great time at WrestleMania 9. Okay. Uh, during your period or of invincibility in WWE, did you ever envision envision yourself becoming a world champion eventually? Uh, definitely. I mean, um, I'm going okay for two years undefeated. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Now yeah. a lot of people, you know, it's like all of this kind of stuff that we're doing and what you fans get to see. The fans now have more exposure because of digital media, social media, everything. They have more exposure to be able to hear us talk and hear the real story. So I went two years undefeated. A lot of people try to compare me and Goldberg, mm -hmm. not taking nothing away from Goldberg, but Goldberg was 173 and 0. You remember? That's what they pushed. Oh, yeah. 173 and 0. I went two years undefeated. I was at at WWF at that time. Yeah, yeah. We were doing approximately about 500 matches a year. Wow. So that's really like a thousand and oh. Yeah. And we were doing double shots on the weekend, one o'clock show during the day, then an eight o'clock show at night. We we're doing two shows. And if you were anybody at TV, you were wrestling twice. So I definitely seen the opportunity for title matches. I wrestled against Yokozuna when he was champion. But everyone wanted to see the last thing, the last question, the last point that you brought up to me was Shawn Michaels and myself. They wanted to see me have the Intercontinental title then. The fan base wanted to have me have it then. Have you heard the story there? No. Okay, well, we might as well go ahead and add a little bit of <laughs> flair, okay, uh, to the Wrestle Rock podcast. Okay? Um, approximately about a year later, not a year later, it was about probably about, I'd say, nine, ten months after WrestleMania 9. I was out with Undertaker and okay. out with also Brett, okay. close friends. Tremendous superstars, of course, in our industry. That's who I hung out with. We went back to Brett's suite one night after us, after an event, okay, after going out to go eat. You know, we sat down, and an undertaker and Brett went to say, hey, Tatanka, actually, Taker said, hey, Chief, I want to talk to you about something. I said, well, what's up, dead man? He said, I want to talk to you about WrestleMania. Well, WrestleMania was coming up in a few okay. months, so I thought he was talking about WrestleMania 10. I said, yeah, what's up, Dead Man? WrestleMania 10. Yeah, I'm looking forward. He goes, no, I'm not talking about WrestleMania 10. I'm talking about WrestleMania 9. And then I looked at Dead Man. I says, what are you talking about, Dead Man? He said, listen, the office had already planned on giving you the title at WrestleMania 9. But Sean and the Click, mm -hmm. back then, the Sean and the Click went around, and everybody says, well, the Click wasn't part there. Yeah. Everyone had their little favorite groups back then. Yeah, Sean yeah. had his favorite group. Exactly. They said that Sean and his little clique went around and saying that I was getting an attitude, having a big head. Mm -hmm. So they actually changed the office to change the decision mm -hmm. that Definitely. not to give me it the was title. It's not easy working with WWE because we are not with the right person on the right spot. Correct. It and if you remember Sean and... when he retired... When he did his retirement speech, if you remember parts of that, one of the things he said, a lot of guys back there don't like me. You know, there's a lot of bad, basically what he was saying, he did a lot of bad things before in his career. He'd given his life to God, but a lot of things he had done beforehand, meaning, uh, come on, we all know about the Montreal screw job, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So same thing, you know, so I was really gunned then for the IC title at WrestleMania 9. And one of the ways that you know it is at the beginning of that match, when we're getting ready to get started, I do that war cry. And you can, when I do that war cry, you can hear the whole building light up. They were ready for me to have the title. And plus, more important than that, throughout all these years of speaking to the fans, mm -hmm. I've realized now how much the fans wanted me to have the title then. They go, you got screwed. You, you needed to have the title then. You know, you, but again, back then, don't forget, when you had a title belt back then, you kept a title belt for a long time. So Sean knew that he wouldn't see that title belt for a while. Look at Brett. How long did he carry the world title for? Almost two years. So when you had a bit, it's not like wrestling today. You kept the belt for a long time. Yeah. So Like Roman Reigns? Of yes. course, you keep the belt for a long time. Just for ending, in Quebec City, there are some rumors regarding your association with an individual named Sonny Ward Cloud. I don't know if you know it, but I don't know if it's true. 
or not, but uh, there is a rumor that you replace him on the WWM, WWF main roster. Is it true or not? No. It, 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 that's the first time I've heard that. Okay, okay. I've, I've, never, I've never heard that. Okay. That's the fir okay. first time that question has been asked to okay. me. Now, maybe, and I'm not saying that maybe he hadn't spoken to WWF, but the way that I got in was it was a very clear thing. The guy who the guy who started me and sent me after I went to Larry after I went to uh, Larry Sharp, okay. the Monster Factory, Monster Factory in New Factory, Jersey. Yeah. Okay, but the person who sent me there was Buddy Rogers. Okay. okay, when I came back, Buddy Rogers sent me to okay. George Scott. Yeah, yeah. You remember George and Sandy Scott? No. Yeah, no, the George no, and Sandy no, Scott was a tag team at WWF. I think that's where they were. Okay. George and Sandy Scott. George Scott was the booker. Okay. Originally for WWF oh, during the Hogan day, okay. doing, doing the Hogan era. Okay. So Hogan I era. went, yeah, I went to go work for okay. George Scott's promotion, which is in the North Carolina, South Carolina and uh, Georgia, Virginia area. That's where I worked for approximately a little bit less than a year, and I got signed by WWF in less than a year. But the way that I got in was not because of an opportunity, okay. something know. of that way. Okay. George Scott picked up the phone, and one of his personal friends at that time was Pat Patterson. Okay. So he yeah. called Pat Patterson. Oh, yeah. He said, you need to see this kid. You need to see him. He's in great shape. Yeah, He's Native yeah. American. He's really Native American. So His really tribe's really a Lumbee tribe. Yeah. They love him. You know, we got him as a face down here. And before you know it, I was getting tryouts after George did that awesome. with WWF. Thank you for your time. So just uh, as usual, uh, as usual, uh, as we can usual. do more. Go ahead. We can do go more. Ahead. Yeah, yeah, go okay, ahead. Okay, yeah. perfect. So you're talking about uh, the Monster Factory uh, with uh, Larry Sharp, of course. And um, can you mention a few other wrestlers who uh, underwent training at Larry, Larry, Shape, uh, uh, Larry Sharp? Larry Sharp, Larry Sharp, sorry. Larry Sharp. Yeah, Larry Sharp. You had, uh, uh, I think, uh, King Kong Bundy King came Kong out of there, yeah. okay? You also had the Headbangers. Headbangers. Headbangers yeah. came out of there. You also had uh, Bam Bam Bigelow. Okay. Went through the Monster the Factory, old, the too. The Hometown Hero. Yeah, yeah. You got a Hometown Hero. And I think there was someone else. I'm not sure at that time. I heard that... Uh, I'm not sure if the Godfather or when, who he was way back then, if he came to the Monster Factory, but those three for sure, definitely. Headbangers, Bam Bam Bigelow, and, wow. uh, and the other gentleman we mentioned. Uh, we did, uh, just before, um, we we're talking about Shawn Michaels, so uh, what is your opinion about uh, the late Sherry Martell? Sherry Martell? Oh, wow. Yeah. Sherry Martel, just tremendous. I mean, uh, she didn't take anything off the boys, meaning she was team. tough. You didn't mess with Sherry Martel. Sherry would <laughs> knock a guy out. If you said something, really? boom, oh, Sherry really? was tough. Wow. She, she, she was bad. tough, but what a great. She's a badass girl. Yeah, badass girl, but what a great her and Miss Elizabeth. They're really the pioneers for women wrestling. They didn't even wrestle, but they did. Luna Vachon, all of them together. They were just tremendous. Sherry Martel was just a tremendous asset. She did so great with Macho Man, with yeah. everyone who she worked with. So she was an asset to the wrestler, and she was just a tremendous asset for the company. So everybody, everybody loves Sherry. Everybody loves Sherry. Uh, go ahead with the Ted DiBiase question. Okay. Why did the stable led by Ted DBSC, I, I, talk, uh, I mean a million dollar corporation, yes. including you, Bigelow, IRS, Sid, and Bundy, dissolve at the end of the 90s? Well, you know, that's, that's a really, really good question, you know, because <laughs> the reason why, I can't tell you how many fans I get that speak to me all the time, they go, that corporation was stacked with talent. That corporation should have been holding lots of gold, mm -hmm. should have had tons of gold. Uh, it just, I mean, look at the talent you had in there. You had Bam Bam Bigelow. You had Kama, which is Papa Shango, Godfather. You had myself. You had Sid Vicious. Uh, I mean, just a stat, and you had IRS. You also had me and Dollar Man Ted DiBiase. I mean, you had a stack, stack million dollar corporation i mean there was a lot of talent there we should have definitely had gold i don't know why we didn't have gold i don't know 
why that was not. I mean, it was a main thing that was highlighted on TV, definitely. We got a lot of coverage, but a lot of people still today feel that we should have gold. But the, the, and let me tell you another reason why we should have gold. Because every fan that I see, no matter where I go, all over the world, you know the angle that they remember the most. You know the storyline that upset them the most is when I sold out to the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Now, really, I tell everybody, Lex sold out because Lex did sell out because Lex called himself the All-American. <laughs> I was Native American, yeah. the true American. He was uh -huh. the sellout saying he was the All-American. You're not the All-American. We're, we're first. Yeah. Our bloodline was first to America. Yes, exactly. We're the true yes. American. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're not the All-American. <laughs> we, I'm the All-American, true. So I always call Lex to sell out. But the fans loved that storyline because they never seen it coming. Mm -hmm. They thought it was going to be Lex that made the turn. So it made such a shock at that time. It's been noted as one of the greatest heel turns. It, it was such a shock to the fan base because they kind of, I remember when we did it. It was Chicago, United Center, 1994. Yeah, I remember. I remember it. I was right there SummerSlam. I remember it. I remember when I did what I did to Lex. You could hear the building go, stop. And you could see the fans going, did I really see what I seen? No, tell me I didn't see what I seen. And all of a sudden, they're boo. When it sunk in, boo. They're going nuts. People were throwing stuff. It was just a great heel turn. Yeah. They were working so hard to get Lex to get him over the top during that time. The Lex Express. He slammed Yokozuna yeah. on the Intrepid. They were doing anything. But after that, when I turned on Lex and when they would announce me, it was boo. And they would announce Lex, boom, because yeah. they really wanted to see him tear my butt up because if fans really got upset so people really got upset it really worked meaning the storyline worked yeah, yeah, it worked exactly. for the fan base so yeah we should have had a lot of gall there's not no specific reason why they dissolved it meaning got rid of it you know that the that it wasn't going on anymore i just think sometimes with creative in our business meaning the people who make decisions was going to happen creatively sometimes they just don't make the best decisions Thank you so much for your time. And just for ending, as usual, yes. my partner, Benoit, a.k.a. Nostradamus Ben, it's all about the French prophet. Yeah. And he tried to predict the future of our guests. So go ahead, my friend. Whoa, I like it. Here we go. <laughs> hey, it better be a good one or he's going to get the tomahawk chop. <laughs> Boom, better be a good one. <laughs> Don't make me someone drop on the table. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll say, I predict to you, you're going to be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame uh, in a few years. Yes. You definitely. deserve it. Yeah, thank yes, you. you. Thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm on a Legends deal with the company, but of course, WWE is a monster. Yeah. You have to let them do things the way they want to do things. I was just speaking to Triple H just recently. Okay. Oh, and okay. I, I constantly speak in with the office. You know, I'm being on a Legends deal, I speak to the office about certain things at times. So, main talent, main office, mm -hmm. but I was... You know, like I said, just speaking to Triple H about something, you know, yeah. just a few months ago. So okay. I'm looking forward to that because, you know, again, WWE is the number one company as far as wrestling worldwide. Years, with the, there's the there's nothing down. else. Yeah, there's nothing else. Yeah. So to, to be in the Hall of Fame with WWE, that is a great honor. And, and a great, again, why it's a great honor for me, too, just like you guys were talking before. Being with First Nations in Canada, me being truly Native American, won an honor, not only for me, but won an honor for our nation of people because yeah. it shows to them I can really do it. It's spotlight. For I, the yeah, it's, it's spotlight for the Native Americans, First Nations, for them to see. Because to, I can't tell how many places I've been, Native lands, that they look at me and go, Tatanka, you were our Hulk Hogan. Yeah, exactly. So, because yeah. they want... A the native blood. They want someone of their own yeah. to be there, and they can relate to it, mm -hmm. and they see if he can do it, then I can do it. So it'd be a great honor to be in the Hall of Fame because that leaves a tremendous door for any native blood to say, if he did that, then I can do whatever I believe in. I can do whatever my dreams are. So that would be another wish of mine that that does happen so I can be more than just myself, but to give back to others. So I'm big on doing that kind of stuff. 
So thank you so much for your time. This is super pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. Thank yes. you very much. Honor to be here. Thank you. So oh, much. you're welcome. Thank you guys. We appreciate you. Goodbye. Honor. Have a great day.